All right, you at home. Hi, glad to be with you. Um, fire up your app. We're gonna have some interactive time. It's raining like crazy right here, and it's totally distracting me because it's amazing. I just wanna go watch it. I, I guarantee you Ben is outside with the youth group right now watching it. Um, okay, so at home, turn on your, get onto your chats, and what is the problem with this technology? Stop it. And you here too, if you want, uh, you want to chime in, you don't want to raise your hand or speak, go to the chats on the, on the um, app, and then there is the live service chat, and um, you can turn the live service chat on, and then you can chime in, and we're going to have some, some uh, times of interaction, and what happens at home, you're like 40 seconds behind us, and so I'll try to check. Uh, so if we ask a question and you want to chime in at home, uh, you can chime in, and I'll, if it's appropriate, I'll read it. Um, <laughs> everybody can see it, not just me, so... <laughs> Anyways, um, and then if you're here and you don't want to speak out, but you want to chime in, you could do it that way too in the live service chat. Um, let's pray. Andrew's taken off with his team. Are you the only one from your team that's here? <laughs> you and Selah. That's good for you guys. Um, yeah, they're leaving early. You're going to meet here at 5 a.m.? 5.30 a.m. They're going to leave. They're taking off. There's 10 adults, 18 kids. If you're with us on Sunday first service, we talked about what Andrew was doing. Uh, Andrew is taking a family life or family missions uh, team down, and they're going down to California where there's a Young Life camp there that uh, reaches some at-risk kids and some um, does some great ministry with some kids that, that need the gospel. And so they're going down to this camp. They're going to help basically do some maintenance on it and some work on it to get it uh, looking good so we can pray for them. And um, did anything come up prayer-wise for that trip specifically? Just, just the direction of our families who had some full opposition to get ready. Yes. Yeah, they are feeling some spiritual warfare. And which it gets me excited as uh, one of the couples in our life group, we were, they were there last night. And we were just kind of excited talking about like, hey, when you step out on my faith, when you, when you really decide you're going to be obedient to God and his word, there's opposition. And we should expect that. And it's kind of exciting when it happens because if you recognize it as a spiritual battle for what it is, you think, man, I'm doing this right. I'm in the right spot here. Now, it's not always fun, <laughs> but as Christians, we can you know, have encouragement there to know that, as Paul talked about, the battle isn't against flesh and blood, but against the spirit. And he who is in you is greater than who is in the world. And so anyway, so let's pray. Lord God, we want to pray for our team going down. Lord, we pray. We know that there's, um, you're aware, God, of some of the stuff that's been happening this week leading up to this trip. God, we do want to pray for a peace of mind in these families that are going. Lord, we lift up the Heckendorfs and the Torix and the Wilsons and the Howlands and the Knudsons. Yes. Thank you, Lord. And we pray for these families, God. You'd bless them, Lord. Help them tonight, Lord, as they make the final packing. Lord, I pray that they would get a good rest, Lord, and they could have peace in their mind and their heart to know that they're, Lord, in your will and that you would go before them, you would go after them, you would go with them. You'd fill them with your Holy Spirit. Give them great grace for one another. Give them endurance for the trip. And God, we pray that there would be a great work done um, in your name, Lord. Bless them, God, we pray and protect them on this drive. Protect them as they do some of this construction work. And God, bring our family back to us safely, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Manuel says it's hailing. Was that appropriate, Manuel? Where are you? Where are you at, Manuel? You're in the building somewhere. I think he maybe he's in the production room. <laughs> Hi, Manuel. <laughs> um... Great. Okay. I feel like there was something else I was supposed to say. 
That was it. So pray for these guys. They take off Thursday, and they'll be back by next Wednesday or Thursday. Yeah, something like that. Okay, open up your Bible. Psalms 24. And if you're just tuning in now at home, just a reminder, we're going to open up our live service chat, and there's going to be an opportunity if you want to chime in with something, you can do that on the app and go to the live service chat. And uh, if I ask a question um, that uh, I'm going to ask questions tonight, you can chime in that way. Psalms 24, what I want to do here is I want to read through this beautiful psalm and then talk about it. So Psalm 24, verse 1, the earth is the Lord's and all it contains. The world and those who dwell in it. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? And who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood. And has not sworn deceitfully. He shall receive a blessing from the Lord. And righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, even Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle, lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. This is a beautiful song. Many believe that there was an event that inspired this. We've seen this before. You know, as we've read the Psalms, we've seen that there's been these different events in David's life that happened, that inspired him to write these. And many think that this was the scene where David wanted to bring the ark back to Jerusalem. And this is recorded for us in 1 Chronicles 13 through 16 and 2 Samuel chapter 6. So let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 6. 1 Chronicles 13 through 16, more details, but it's a lot of scripture. 2 Samuel chapter 6, Less details, same basic story. So go ahead and turn there. So this event happens, and then it's believed that this was the inspiration that led David to write Psalm 24. 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 1 says, David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel... 30,000. And David arose and he went with all the people who were with him to Baal Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name, the very name of the Lord of hosts, who is enthroned above the cherubim. So at this point, at this point, the ark has not been in the city. It's been out for a while. And David wants to bring it back into the city. It says, They placed the ark of God on a new cart that they might bring it from the house of Abinadab which was on the, the hill. And Yuza and Ohio, the sons of Abinadab, were leading a new cart. And so they brought it with the ark of God. So they brought it with the ark of God from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill in Ohio, and walking ahead of the ark. Meanwhile, David and all the household of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with all kinds of instruments made of fir wood and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and symbols. Remember that the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant here is represented the very presence of God. And when they had the Ark with them, there was great success. There was great joy. But there was also some specific instructions on how they would transport the Ark. So there they are. They're transporting the Ark. They're very excited about this event. But verse 6, when they came to the threshing floor of Nikon, Yuza reached out towards the ark of God and took hold of it for the oxen nearly upset it. So it almost fell over. And the anger of the Lord burned against Uzzah and God struck him down there for his irreverence. And he died there by the ark of God. So they were instructed uh, to not touch the ark. There was only certain people that could touch it, certain way that it could be done. And David became angry because the Lord's outburst against Uzzah. 
And that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. So David was afraid of the Lord that day. And he said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? And David was unwilling to move the ark of the Lord into the city of David with him. But David took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. Thus the Lord, sorry, thus the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. So kind of a, don't, don't, leave your finger there. A little bit of a, kind of a climax and then a letdown. David very excited with what he, uh, verse 1, the men of Israel, 30,000, I mean, massive gathering, very excited about bringing in the presence of God, the Ark of the Covenant, back into the city, a, a place where they could have worship, a place where they could set up in the tent, a place where the priests could do their sacrifices. It's a very exciting thing. They're, they're, they're dancing, it says in verse 5. There are all kinds of worship. And then this spiritual battle happens. They're on mission, and there's a bump in the road. So he calls it off. He parks the ark. Here's a lesson for us. That's all. I don't even want to go there. That's a whole other thing there. I could go down a rabbit trail here. Okay, but it's told now of the king, verse 12, that the Lord blessed the house of Obed-Edom. So this is, this is consistent with where the Ark of the Covenant is. There's this blessing. Where the presence of God is, there's this blessing. And all that belongs to him on account of the Ark of God. And David went and brought up the Ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David with gladness. And so it was that when the bearers of the Ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed an ox and a fatling. <laughs> so they're taking extra precaution. Every six paces, they have a sacrifice. So David and all the house of Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouting and the sound of a trumpet. And then it happened as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David that Michal, the daughter of Saul, this was David's wife that he got through the uh, conquering of Goliath, looked out the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. So they brought up, they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent, which David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And when David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts, Further, he distributed to all the people, to all the multitude of Israel, both the men and women, a cake of bread and one of dates and one of raisins to each one. Then all the people departed, each to his house. We're not going to finish the, the chapter here. Exciting event. There was a little hitch in the giddy up there. There was a little trouble on the trail. Pause for a little bit, got back to it. Some real fear there, right? I mean, this guy just, the ark was going to fall off from the basic just surface of the text. He's trying to steady the ark, but it was against God's law, against God's ordinances. It caused fear for David, and maybe he questioned, who can be in the presence of God? Psalm 24. Let's go there. Turn back to Psalm 24. So with this event in mind, think about David writing this song here. The earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it, for he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. What is David declaring right here? Okay, this is your turn, by the way. So you at home, you'll be a little bit late, but that's okay. If you want to chime in, you can. You hear. What is David declaring? Everything belongs to the Lord. Everything belongs to the Lord. Who controls the earth? God. The Lord. Who's in charge? The Lord. 
the Lord of everything? Everything. Everything. Genesis chapter 1, verse 9 says that, Genesis 1, 9 through 10, then God said, let the waters below, let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth and the gathering of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. This is declaring God as the creator. The earth is the Lord's, all that it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who, verse 3, may ascend into the hill of the Lord? And who may stand in his holy place? What is he asking here? It's in a very basic way. What is he asking? Who, who can be worthy of being in the presence of God? And this is what he saw on the trail there as they steadied the ark. Who is worthy? Who can come into the presence of God? We understand that unrighteousness cannot come into the presence of God's holy righteousness. He answers the question, verse 4. He who has clean hands and pure hearts who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood and has not sworn deceitfully. You recognize this from one of the songs we sang tonight? Give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. I asked, I texted uh, Isaac yesterday told him what psalms we were in and there's loaded with different worship songs. I don't know about you, but um, when I read these verses, it's like, okay, verse 3, who can come into the presence of God? Verse 4, oh, those who are clean and pure. I immediately think, oh, I'm out. And then I remember the gospel, and I think, oh, I'm in. Thank you, Jesus. And it makes me so thankful for God's grace. Because me and myself, I'm out. I'm dead. I cannot come into the presence of God. But because of the work that Jesus Christ did on the cross, I'm in. I can come into the presence of God. The Bible declares that we're all sinners. I'm going to run through a couple of these verses. Romans 3.23. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23. The wages of that sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than that, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. That was wrath, the death. They're studying the ark. There was wrath there. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him which takes me to Hebrews. I want you to turn there with me here. So look over to Hebrews. Towards the end of your New Testament. Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9 is addressing this old covenant, new covenant thing and the, the old agreement that God had with Israel based on the sacrificial system and then this new covenant that God had made with all people through the sacrifice of his son. It was a covenant of grace. And much is said there through the, the work of the blood of Jesus. But one of the key verses is verse 14 where he talks about that old system. How much more, so nine Hebrews 9, verse 14, how much more will the blood of Christ who through the through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. He has this comparison about the, the way that the sacrificial system worked, about the sprinkling of the animal's blood and how it would cause this cleansing. But how much more will the blood of Christ cleanse you? And then he says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10, 
We're talking more about this sacrifice of Christ. By this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. We've talked a bit about sanctification the last few weeks on Sunday mornings. What, what is sanctification? What's a, what's a real simple way to describe that? Set apart for a purpose. And so here we see by the will, by this will, this is God's will, we've been sanctified, set apart for a purpose, through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Go to verse 19, chapter 10, verse 19. Therefore, the conclusionary statement of what Hebrews chapter 9 and chapter 10 is teaching, therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, holy place, talking about the presence of God, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, he's talking about Jesus, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and to good deeds, not forsaking our own assembly together as the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So let's ask the question again of chapter of Psalms 24, verse 3. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord and who may stand in his holy place? Who can come into the presence of God? Who, who can go in the presence of God? Come on, be bold. Through faith, well, okay, so the answer is verse 4, he who has clean hands and a pure heart. How do we, who has clean hands and a pure heart? We do through the blood of Jesus. It, it said there in Hebrews, drawn near with a sincere heart full of assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let's hold fast to this confession of hope. That's what this is. Our faith, what we believe is the gospel, this good news, is a confession of hope that we can be bold and have this full assurance that we have these clean hands and pure hearts through Jesus Christ. And we received that forgiveness of sins, and we've been cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Look at the blessing. Chapter 24, verse 5. He shall receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. So this speaks to the idea that we're sanctified and we are made righteous. We talked about that Second 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He who made knows... He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And so this is the work that Jesus does. This is what the gospel is communicating. And so I think we have these times where we may ask this question honestly, how can I come into the presence of God? Who is worthy to come into the presence of God? It's only those who have been sprinkled clean by the blood of Jesus who have accepted the forgiveness of sins, who has repented and received forgiveness. At that point, there's a blessing. And we can be this generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, even Jacob. So, who is Jesus? Verse 7. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, the King of glory, so that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient 
doors that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. This King Jesus, he's the Lord. He's strong. He's mighty. I love these lines here. It talks about lifting up your head, opening your gates, opening your doors. Let the King in. Revelation chapter 3, verse 19. Jesus speaks, Those whom I love I reprove and discipline. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and will dine with him and he with me. Open up your doors of your heart. Open up your life. Let King Jesus come in. Let the King of glory come in. I love that line there. Put that um, Revelation scripture back up for a second, if you would. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. This is where we're going in Psalm 25. It seems as though David makes this declaration that, yeah, the Lord does reprove. He does discipline. And when we feel the discipline of the Lord, let's be zealous about repenting so we can be in this right place with God. Okay, you can take that out. Thank you, guys. I think this is something when we consider the life of David and there's much to be considered about the life of David, but you know, he is called the God after man, the man after God's own heart. And and then we often we think about that and then we if you know the story of David, you sort of gonna start going through like this laundry list of odd sins and different things that he did, and you sort of wonder, well, how is this the man after God's own heart? And yet he had this weird things that he did that some heart sometimes they don't match up. I think something that we see in David, and much has been said about this, but this devotion that he had to God, I think it equates to this idea of being zealous. And he also was a man of repentance. And we see in the scriptures at times that he gets called out for his sin and he repents. And we see throughout the Psalms that he confesses his sin before God. And then I think this is what draws him in, his devotion to God and his recognition of his sin, a confession of his sin, his repentance. And so that's why I love that line in Revelation where it says to be zealous and repent. We should have this passion, zealousness for the Lord, this passion for God, but be passionate about repenting. And what does repentance do? What do you guys think? When, when, when you repent, what is it doing? in your own heart, in your life. Let's throw some ideas out there. What is the action of repenting? What, what does it do? Huh? Yes. What? Turn away. Yeah, the action is actually to turn away. Um, what? Turning to God. Yep. And you turn to God, you're turning your back on the sin. And... I like that word humble that Nick used. Um, course correction. Course correction, yep. Kind of refocus. Yeah. What else? Maybe that's all. I don't know. Is there anything else? I think there's a lot with the, with the idea of humility. Because when you, when you are confessing your sin to God, you're admitting that you're wrong. Anybody like to admit that they're wrong? I hate to admit that I'm wrong, so I just try not to never, I just, I'm never wrong, you know. <laughs> but you know what's worse? I don't know if this is worse. Someone who doesn't admit they're ever wrong. But you know, you know they're wrong, and they know they're wrong, and then they don't admit it. I worked with somebody like that one time, and it was really difficult. So when you're repenting, when you're confessing your sin to God, you're saying, I was wrong. I was wrong. 
It's humbling. It, it, you realize that you are not God. That God is God. And so I think this helps us. Would, this is something I think with David. The devotion, the zealousness, and the thing of repentance. We see this here in Psalm 25. Now, I want to show you something before we read the psalm. Th this psalm is really cool. It's an alphabetic acrostic poem. And there are a few psalms that do this. Uh, do we have the image of that one, you guys? Okay, can you see that? Uh, it's not, not great. Okay, but you can kind of see what's going on here. There are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. Psalm 25, there's 22 verses. Each verse starts off with a letter from the Hebrew alphabet, and it goes down. We lose that in our English translation. But I was thinking, how cool would that be if you were trying to memorize a chapter and you knew that every line of the chapter started with the next letter in the alphabet? You'd come be like, oh, where am I at? Verse 10, I don't know, you know, J or whatever. And you'd remember that in the next line, you know. Um, so Psalms 25 is this, and it's really neat. Um, Psalms 119 does that in sections. And there's other acrostic um, psalms that do that. But, okay, you can take that away. That's cool. Let's read. Psalm 25. Oh, okay, this is where I want to hear from you. I, as I read this, I want to hear from you. I want you to follow along, and if something grabs you, highlight that, write that down, just make note of that. And I want to hear from you after we read this. And I want to make a couple of observations here. But if something really sticks out to you, or maybe it points to this devotion, or it points to this repentance, uh, if it speaks to you, I want to hear from you. So let's read this and be thinking about this and see what the Lord might grab your attention with. To you, O oh Lord, I lift up my soul. O oh my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be ashamed. Do not let my enemies exult over me. Indeed, none of those who wait for you will be ashamed. Those who deal treacherously without cause will be ashamed. Make me know your ways, O oh Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day. Remember, O oh Lord, your compassion and your loving kindness, for they have been from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your loving kindness, remember me. For your goodness sake, O oh Lord. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs the sinners in the way. He leads the humble in justice, and he teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are loving kindness and truth to those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. For your name's sake, O oh Lord, pardon my iniquity, for it is great. Who is the man who fears the Lord? He will instruct him in the way he should choose. His soul will abide in prosperity, and his descendants will inherit the land. The secret of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he will make them know his covenant. My eyes are continually towards the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the net. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Bring me out of my distress. Look upon my afflictions and my trouble and forgive all of my sins. Look upon my enemies, for there are many, and they hate me with violent hatred. Guard my soul and deliver me. Do not let me be ashamed, for I take refuge in you. Let integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. Redeem Israel, O God, out of all of his troubles. Come on, I want to hear from you. Trust. Trust, okay. That was a big thing, trusting the Lord, yeah. Yeah, amen. What else grabbed you? Was there a verse? Was there a phrase? Was there a repeated theme? Four and five, knowing the Lord's ways and having the Lord lead us. 
the teaching. I love that. Yeah. Make me know your ways. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truths. Teach me. Yeah. Yeah, there's much to be said about God's character in this psalm. He, verse 8, good and upright is the Lord. Yeah, and it seems that there's much trouble, right? He says, he says, I'm lonely and afflicted. Verse 17, the troubles of my heart are enlarged. What else? What else grabbed you here? What spoke to you? What was the one verse that was, I read that, you went, wow. That's what's so amazing to me about the Psalms, how these emotions that were written 3,000 plus years ago are so real and so raw and can just, you just, you're right there with them. How about the secret? Everybody, everybody always wants to know the secret of things, right? What does he say there in verse 14? The secret of the Lord is for those who fear him. There's a call for reverence to God, to know the secrets of the Lord. What are the secrets of the Lord? In the New Testament, it talks about the mystery of this salvation, the mystery of our gospel. Okay, so let's do a couple things here. What, I want to go through verses, and I want you to tell me. What is David declaring in verse 2? What is he declaring there in verse 2? Trust. Trust. What is he declaring in verse 3? Okay, but a little bit different word. Let's use a different word. Huh? Faith. Faith? Yeah, he says, if, if you wait on the Lord, you will not be ashamed. What is he declaring in verse 5? For you are the God of my salvation. What's he declaring in verse 8? God's good. Yeah. And I love that. He, <laughs> he makes this appeal and he does this in other psalms. It's like, forgive me according to your goodness. You know? What's he declaring in verse 15? That's what Barb already talked about. Is a God will rescue. Verse 17. I have trouble. Okay, let's talk about what he's requesting. What is he requesting in verse 4? What does he want in verse 4? Huh? Direction. Teach me. That's, that's discipleship. Disciple me, Lord. Remember that scripture in Revelation 3. From those whom I love, I discipline, I reprove, I correct, I disciple. What's he requesting in verse 6? Mercy. 
mercy. What about verse 11? Wait, I I skipped one. Let's talk about verse 7. I don't know about you, but I got a lot of sins from my youth. Oh, Lord, do not remember the sins of my youth. Anybody ever prayed that prayer? Come on. (laughs) Don't remember my sins from yesterday. Lord, please. (laughs) Okay, verse 11. What is he asking? Forgiveness. Verse 16, he's looking for grace. Verse 18, look upon me. Look upon my afflictions. And again, forgive me my sins. See, David wasn't sinless. But he was honest to God, honest with God about those. And when confronted, he came clean. Sometimes it took a little while, but he came clean. What is he asking in verse 19? What does he want in verse 19? Justice. Justice. Yeah, he's got enemies. There's opposition. Lord, Take out these guys. Come on. And what do we read, though, in chapter 24? God is uh, he's the king of glory, the strong and mighty. He's the, the king of the Lord of hosts. That's the Lord of armies. What's he asking in verse 20? Protection. Protection. And then verse 22, what is he praying for? What is he asking? Huh? Redemption for the nation. Look at this prayer. Look at what David is declaring. Look what he's requesting. I, I encourage you, know this psalm. Let this psalm direct your prayer life. Let it guide you in a, in a prayer. A prayer of declaring how good God is, who God is, confessing of your sins, Appealing for help from God, praying for the nation, taking your difficulties to Him. I mean, He takes His sins to Him, He takes His affliction, He takes His distresses, His worries, and He takes them to the God who actually can do something about it. I think this is a wonderful outline for our, our prayer life, and I highly encourage you to to know this and to personally to know it. Okay, any final thoughts before we close out the night? Let's pray this right now. I I want to open up the floor. We can just pray. If you would like to pray, pray out loud. We'll agree with you. Um, If you have a prayer need, let's just lift it up right now. God, we come before you, Lord and Creator. Lord, we confess that you're in charge. Lord, the the earth is yours, all that contains the world, and we who dwell in it. For you are the Creator. Lord, I want to pray for our nation. Lord, sometimes I'm not even sure what to pray. But God, I know there is division, and I know that there's evil. And Lord, I'm asking of you to intervene. And Lord, as I think about the body of believers in our country, I pray that you would unite us.